Well, we're continuing our study of running well and finishing well. We have been studying all of the seven tribes that, uh, that God told the Israelites they had to conquer in the promised land. Remember, he told them, he said, they are larger than you, they are stronger than you, and you will never be able to defeat them without him. Never, because he's the one that will give you victory over all these enemies. And so the enemies that they had to defeat are types for us and symbols. The meaning of their names will tell us these things that are in our lives, in our soul, that you and I war against all the time. We have done four of them, and we're going to start number five today. And this is another big enemy. We are going to look at the iniquity of the Amorites. And we will see why it's important that we allow God to defeat this in our life. Today is going to be more of a background lesson on what it was like on the east side of the Jordan River. Because he's going to tell them they have to conquer that before they can ever go into the land. So we want to look at that today. Why was it so important? What did God want them to accomplish on the east side of the Jordan River? Because the promised land, remember, is on the west side. That's where he's going to have them cross the Jordan River. Now, it's a turning point in the the lives of the nation of the children of Israel. They got rid of the older generation. (laughs) Okay, I thought that would bring more laughter. Okay. So we have a turning point because we're finally rid. What have they been doing for 38 years, marching out in the wilderness, watching all the ones 20 years and up die because of unbelief and rebellion that they would not go in and take the land? So their time of divine discipline, they had 38 years after the incident at Kadesh Barnea. So that's all over now. And Israel now can look forward. We're ready to go into our promised land. It's finally here. And this is the new generation, right? And for 38 years, what have they done? They've watched all these older people die. And it was a punishment. So they know that God's serious. So we have this new generation, and we are going to go into our land now and defeat our enemies in our promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and chapter 3 tell us much of God's instructions now when he tells them it is time for you to quit marching around in this wilderness. And so in Deuteronomy 2, he says, you have spent too much time around this mountain. And we all agree, if you lived in the wilderness like I did for many years, it is time to get out of the wilderness and start marching towards my promised land, which is our abundant life. And he says, I want you to turn here and head north. So that's what we're going to be looking at. That's his specific instructions. Why am I turning and then heading north? He says, you've been circling this mountain You've been circling and circling, living in the wilderness, and it is time to move forward. Now, he's got a caution. Before we get started on this journey, God's going to give us some instructions. Are we to pay attention? Absolutely. And he says, you're to put your trust in God. This is what Moses is still in charge. Moses said, you're going to put your trust in God, and then you're going to march on, and we first are going to capture the land on the east side of the river, on the east side. Now, here are the commands in verses 4 and 5. Command the people, you are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau. These are the Edomites. So are we now going to come, we're going to see that conflict again between Jacob and Esau. Remember, it went on in the womb, and it continued. So we're going to see that conflict. They dwell in Seir, and they will be, they're going to be afraid of you. You take good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Don't provoke them. Ah, brother and brother and brother, brother and sister, don't provoke them. For I'm not giving you any of their land, not even a footprint, because I have given that to Esau as their possession. Okay, we've got our instructions, right? He goes on, and here is what I want to show you. 
Uh, now, I don't think your map goes this low, so you need to look up here. The white circle is Kadesh Barnea, which is going to be off of your map. The blue circle is Edom. Now, do you see if I come over and I'm going to turn up and go north to that yellow arrow? The yellow arrow is where I'm going to cross the Jordan River. Do you see that I have got to go to, through the blue circle? Everybody see it? And that's what he says. You're going to go through the land of Edom, but you don't provoke them, and you don't get any of their land. So that's our instruction so far. And then he said in verse 9, then you're going to go to Moab, and you can't provoke them because I'm not giving you any of their land, none of it, because I gave that to the sons of Lot. This is Moab, which is one of the, the offspring of Lot's daughters. Remember, we left him last week. He was in a cave with those two girls who got him drunk, and they each had a son by him. And this is one of them. So now look at the map again. We're at the white dot. We're going through Edom, the red dot. And then we're going to come up north a little bit more, and we have the blue dot, which is Moab. Will any of that belong to us? No, because he gave that to Moab. Okay? Now, in verse 19, now you're going to come opposite the sons of Ammon. That's the other son of Lot. Don't attack them. Don't provoke them. I'm not giving you any of the land of the sons of Ammon because I gave it to the sons of Lot. Look up at the map again. Do you see our problem as we are turning and going north from the white circle? We've got to go through Edom. We have to turn north and go through Moab and through Ammon, and then we'll be up at the place where we could cross the Jordan River. But we've been told we can't provoke them, and none of that land will belong to us. Okay? Y'all following me? Now, if you will look at the map up here, it tells us it is going to take them 20 months to get there. We're going to have a lot of delays. 20 months. So I am starting at the red star. At the red star, and I'm trying to get to the yellow star. That's, that's our goal. Let's see what happens. Edom refuses that we can go through their land. See, the conflict between them, even though we are relatives, but we have a problem. They won't let us go through. So do you see the red star where I'm starting? The orange star is Edom, and there you see the purple dotted line? I'm going to have to go up, down and all the way around and come up on the other side. So that's part of my problem, and this is a much more mountainous area. The terrain is very difficult, so that, but that's what we're going to have to do because Edom says no. It tells us in verses 14 through 18, Moses sends some messengers ahead from Kadesh to go to Edom, the head of Edom, and he says, your brother Israel you know all the hardships that have befallen us. Our fathers went down to Egypt. We dwelt in Egypt a long time. The Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. And we cried out to the Lord. He heard our voice and he sent an angel and he brought us up out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh. We're just a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. And he says, we will not pass through your fields. We won't go through your vineyards, nor will we drink water from your wells. We'll go along the king's highway, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We will not turn aside from the right or the left off of the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. And Edom said to him, you shall not pass through our land because I'll come out against you with a sword. I don't believe we'll go through there, right? Our brother doesn't like us very well, so we're going to have to take a detour. Now, I think this is the map you have, if I remember correctly. This King's Highway, you see that. Now, this is the first time the King's Highway is mentioned in the Bible. It starts way up at Damascus. All right. This takes place towards the end of Moses' life. Remember, Moses is going to be on the east side of the Jordan, and they're going to conquer some stuff, but then Moses is going to die, right? Because he cannot go into the land. 
He requests from Edom's king that these Israelites be allowed to follow the royal pathway, that's your black line, through his land as they journey to claim their inheritance. But the Edomites have a terse refusal of Moses' request. They threaten war on them, and they force God's people, you're going to have to take a longer route, much longer, and it's much harder. They said, road closed. Basically, you cannot go through here. Did they ask? Yes, and they made a plea, said, we won't take anything, we won't do anything. But they said no. So in verses 21 and 22, Edom refuses to give Israel passage through his border. So Israel turns away, and the children of Israel, the whole congregation, they're going to journey from Kadesh, and they're going to come up to Mount Hor. So if you look at the map again up here, we've been at the red star. Edom, the orange star, won't let us go through, so we can go over and then turn up north. So we're following down to the blue star. That's Mount Hor. Aaron is going to die here, Moses' brother. So we're, we've had to go to Mount Hor, and we're making a detour. And we're still trying to get to the yellow star. All right? Now, this King's Highway is the most important north-south biblical trading route that existed east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. It was an ancient trade and military route that began at Damascus. So I believe your map has the little arrow up at the top that says to Damascus. And then you follow that, the line there, and that was called the King's Highway, military trade route from north to south. Now, we, see, we find Chera de Lomer. Now, that should ring a bell from the lesson a couple of weeks ago. He's the king of Elam, and I'm going to review it. He was angered. Remember the five foolish kings below the Dead Sea? Yeah, in the Valley of Siddim. And we have King Elam over here. He's over in the Babylonian era, area. Okay, he's angered because the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah rebelled against him. Why did they rebel? We've been paying you taxes and tribute for 12 years, and we're sick of it. And so he comes over, and he's going to show them what for. And he's going to bring that whole evil empire and come around over below the Dead Sea and just try to decimate them. But on the way, he attacks seven cities on the king's highway. They hadn't done anything, but he just attacks them. So you can see my map up here. On the left side, you see the yellow dot is the Dead Sea. Okay, the green area below is the Valley of Siddim, and you have Sodom and Gomorrah, and you have those five cities down there. You see Blue Boy Lot? Okay, he was there when the king came. And then over on the right, the map on the right, you've got Elam in the green. He is Cheridolomer. He is the king of Elam. He gets so mad at the boys over here in green, and he is going to make a journey of almost 900 miles the evil empire, and he's going to come over and get on to them because they won't pay him tribute anymore. So they rebel, and he comes over, and on the way, he destroys seven cities that weren't rebelling against him. Okay. Now, this began with overcoming. This is the first war that's mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 14. It began with overcoming those giant warriors, warriors that lived in Ashtaroth. Do you see Ashtaroth on your map? There were giants living there. He then destroyed the Zuzims, Emmons, Horites as he journeyed south to El Paran, which was near Ezi and Geber, which is the bottom of your map. Those other names that I just mentioned are tribes of giants. There were giants living in different areas, but they had different names. Okay? Now... We have another delay. We're going to Moab. And if you look at my map again, y'all are going to get neck exercise. Okay. We look here, and remember we have, we have now come through. We're at the Blue Star down at Mount Horeb. We're coming up north now on the other side of Edom because he wouldn't let us pass. We come up to the Purple Star. This is Moab. We're going to have another delay here because now... The king of, ba of uh, Moab, King Balak, he is going to hire Balaam to come curse Israel, right? Yep. 
And no, we all know the story of the talking donkey and all of that. So what's the result of this delay? Balaam instructs the king there. He says, I know what to get them. Get your women to be seductive. Get your women and have them go seduce the men. So the Israelite men, weak, they began to mingle with the Moabite women who were seducing them. And so we have intermarriage there. We have pagan worship coming into the Israelite camp. And they're joining in the worship of Baal Peor. Who is really mad? God is really mad. And the result of this, now remember, this is the new generation. These are the younger people. And what happened? He kills 24,000 of them. We haven't even really started our battles yet, and we lost 24,000 people. So God's response, he's very angry. He sends a plague among the people, and he commanded Moses, take your leaders, you execute them publicly, and put their corpses out on public display to turn my wrath away. That's a good example for the rest of us, right? Okay. Now, I want you to go back with me, and now we're with Abraham. <laughs> Y'all over here with me? We're back in Genesis 15. God's telling Abraham all of the things about the promises and the covenant. And he said, remember, he said, now, Abraham, your people, they're going to have to go down to Egypt for a while, right? Because I'm going to give these Amorites time to repent. And he said, it's, I'm going to give them about 400 years. But in the fourth generation, your people will come back here again because the iniquity of the Amorite will then be full. So you and I are going to discuss the iniquity of the Amorite because I found it fascinating. So the Amorites, remember, they're an iniquitous people, but their sin was not yet at a level that God said, destroy them utterly. He gave them time. The long-suffering the patience of our Lord. He's so patient and long-suffering. Aren't we glad? Yes. Amen. But he also was with the, with the Amorites who were very pagan. So it says, but Nahum tells us there comes a time when God's wrath boils over and the wound is too deep to heal. We go to Nahum 3.19. There's no healing for your wound. Your injury is fatal. All who hear the report of you clap their hands over you. Who hasn't felt your endless cruelty? Isn't that how we would feel when God destroys people that have been wicked and persecuting us and oppressing us for 400 years? And they're wicked and God rains favor on them and the wickedness increases. So, this is the first major Antediluvian, what does that mean? After the flood. The flood, diluvian is flood. Ante, so we've got the first major battle between godly believers and the Rephaim. We're going to be talking about the Rephaim today. Took place in the region east of the Jordan River. We're going to have two major kings. King Og of Bashan, and we're going to have King Sihon of Heshbon, two Amorite kings, and they and all the land they possess on the east side of the Jordan stands between the nation of Israel and them getting to go into the promised land. Now, the, initial, uh, the Israelites initially are going to go request from King Sihon, please let us come through, but they found themselves immediately in a battle. Remember, Sihon is a huge Amorite king, and he's also very pagan. He has a lot of land, and the nation of Israel needs to conquer it. Now, here are these two kings we're talking about. These are the two giants that the nation of Israel has to face before they ever cross the Jordan River into their land. We have King Sihon and King Og. Scriptures on them from Numbers and Deuteronomy, they figure Og was probably 11 feet tall, at least. And then you have King Sihon. Both Amorite 
totally pagan kings, and from the Arnon River, which is on your map, clear up to the top of your map, these two kings held. They held all of that land on the east side. Now, these larger-than-life enemies are the last two enemies that Moses is still going to be in charge. And they will be defeated on the, uh, uh, behalf of the children of Israel. The conquest of these two kings is miraculous. It is imagine unimaginable what is going to happen with these two kings. So we have two fierce warriors. Are you all focused on them? We have two of them. But we know with God... Nothing is impossible, right? Are we going to have victory? It doesn't look like it in the eyes of man. If I were coming up against him and all of his army, I would think no way. So these are formidable Amorite foes. If we go to the book of Joshua, we see the men of Ai were called Amorites. And then we had the armies of Sihon and Og over here on the east side. They also were territorial spirits. In other words, this is my territory, you stay out. And we're going to see that next week when we really dig into characteristics of a person with an Amorite spirit. Now, they like to dominate over great numbers of people. So I think we're, we're pretty much on your map now. The map you have is the one I'll be using a lot now. So we have from down at... Uh, the blue stars up here are Edom and Moab. I can't remember if they're on your map. Down at the bottom? Okay, just barely. Okay, now, you and I have come from Edom and Moab and uh, Ammon. Now, the orange star up here was going to start at the River Arnon. And so from the River Arnon up to the River Jabbok. You see those on your map? Okay, that is the area of King Sihon, S-I-H-O-N. And then from the river Jabbok clear up to Mount Hermon is Og of Bashan. Do you see that they have the entire area? And they're Amorite kings. And we're going to talk about the land of Bashan before we get in there. Okay. Now, we're going to start, start with Sihon. He is a king of the Amorites. He's a warrior. He's a mighty king, and he has a very strong and terrible army. He ruled from Heshbon. If you see Heshbon on your map, that was his headquarters. So there's where he stays most of the time. And he has a very pagan nation. We are in the time of Moses. Moses is still the leader. And your Sea of Galilee, do you see your Sea of Galilee up there? So you kind of have your bearings do you see that the arrow where you would cross at Jericho? And then you see Jerusalem. So you kind of have your bearings of where you are geographically. Now, in Deuteronomy 2, 24 to 25, here's God's instructions. Rise up, get on your journey. You now are going to pass over the river Arnon. You see that in, on the bottom of your map. That's where you're going to pass over. This is for the nation of Israel. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon. He's already given him to me. King of Heshbon and his land, all of that land, you go possess it and contend with him in battle. There's God's instructions. And then he tells them, this day, I'm going to begin to put the dread of you and the fear of you in all those nations under the whole heaven who are going to hear the report about you. They are going to tremble and they're going to be in anguish because of you. Little old Israel who just lost 24,000 people. Okay? But God's putting the fear in the enemy. So, even the most powerful Canaanite kings began to fear the power of God. And so as a result, God's people, we are no longer afraid to face our giants and those powerful armies that are ahead of us. And we're learning to trust God no matter how big our problem. That's where, some, that's where we need to be. Exactly where you and I need to be. So in Numbers 21, let's see what happens. 
Israel is going to send messengers unto Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and ask him, let me pass through thy land. We won't turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We won't drink of the water of your wells, but we're going to go along. There's that king's highway again, and now you know what it is and where it is. Until we're past your border and we're out of your territory. Okay, so he has a territory, right? Now, here is that Amorite spirit. He refused. He gathers all of his people together and he goes out against Israel. He goes to the wilderness and on your map you can see he's going to come down to Jahaz. So remember his headquarters was at Heshbon. You and I are coming up from the river Arnon, right? And he is going to come down to Jahaz. Everybody see that on your map? Okay, so you see where the action is. We're kind of coming to Jahaz. And he comes out and he's going to fight against Israel. This is a huge characteristic of an Amorite spirit. They will threaten anybody that they want authority over and you are not submissive to them. They will threaten you. <clears throat> so it says now Israel goes out and they smote him with the edge of the sword they possessed his land from Arnon to Jabbok you can see that on your map down from the river up to the river Jabbok and they took all of his cities they dwelt in all of his cities in Heshbon and in all of his villages they took over the whole land amazing huh did God say I would give it to you? Yeah. He, he did. Now, Israel defeated this mighty enemy that seemed indestructible. Well, this is going to only add fuel to the fire, right? What do the people think about my fierce reputation now? Yeah. It began spreading into Canaan even before they crossed the Jordan River. Because when they get to Jericho with Rahab the harlot, she says, we heard about what y'all did over here to King Sihon and Og. So the fear is spreading to the enemy. Now, after this victory, Moses and his men are going to head for the land of Bashan. And this is where you and I are going to focus for the rest of the lesson. Headed for the land of Bashan. Now, you're going from the river Jabbok, clear up now to Mount Hermon. Huge area. Gilead is in there all the way up. And this is ruled by King Og. He is a Rephaim. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So they head for his land. This land between the river Jabbok and Mount Hermon have 60 walled cities. 60. These cities are fortified, are they not? Walls and gates and bars up. And he had many unwalled towns. And this is the guy that is about 11 feet tall. He's the one who's... His bedstead is recorded in the Bible, is about 13 feet by 6 feet. Now, Og, king of Bashan, is known as one of the Rephaim. Rephaim means terrible ones. They were giants and fierce fighters. I don't want to come up against them, but yet we all face giants. So, they turn now. They're going to go up the road to Bashan and Og, and the king of Bashan he comes out. He comes out with all of his people, and he's going to meet us in a battle at Edrei, and you should see that on your map. Do you see Edrei? Okay. He is going to come there, and that's where the battle is going to take place. We see Mount Hermon way up at the top, the river Jabbok, but he's going to come at Edrei. Now, I have a question. He has a massive defensive advantage true he has 60 walled cities why would he leave those cities and enter into open combat with Israel why would he take the risk when his armies could remain behind their walls and just see if the Israelites could lay siege to him why go to Joshua 24 12 I sent the hornet before you which drove them out before you, even the two kings of the Amorites. Wow. So God, remember God sent plagues and stuff in Egypt? 
He's sending the hornets to the two kings of the Amorites to drive them out. So he said, not with thy sword nor with thy bow. That's not how you defeated them. I sent a hornet and drove them out. And he goes on in his instructions and he says, the Lord said to Moses, do not be afraid of him. Have you ever noticed how many times you're with a giant and it says, don't be afraid? Yes. Don't be afraid of him. I have delivered him into your hands along with his whole army and all of his land. And you're going to do to him like you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites. Wow. So do you see here that God's putting faith in his people, but he's putting the fear in the enemy? Taking the fear out of me and putting faith in me. So it tells us in Numbers later, they smote him and his sons, all of his people. That's a huge area with 60 walled cities until there was none left alive. They got every one of them. And they possessed his land. So now... These two battles, do you see that the Israelites now have possession and have utterly destroyed everything on the east side of the river? Everything. Now, these 60 wall cities, we captured all his cities at that time. There wasn't a city which we did not take from them. 60 cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og, and Bashan. We got everything. What a victory. All these cities were fortified with high walls. They had gates and bars besides a great many unwalled towns. We utterly destroyed them as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon. We utterly destroyed the men, the women, and the children of every city. We took the animals and the spoil of the city. That was our plunder that we took. So at that time... We took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan from the valley of Arnon to Mount Hermon. Do you see the er that area on your map? I mean, you're from the bottom of your map to the top of it. All the cities of that plateau, we took all of Gilead, we took all of Bashan, as far as Salica and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. So if you look at the map, we have victory now from north to south. Right? We've got it all in this valley of Arnon, and God has given us victory. Now, in Amos 2.9, well, Deuteronomy 3.11, it says, King Og of Bashan was the last survivor of the giant Rephaites. Well, they're telling us that, so it must be important. His bed was made of iron. It was 13 feet by about 6 feet wide. It can still be seen in the Ammonite city of Rabbah. And I think you can see Rabbah on, Rabba on your map. In Amos 2.9 it says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. He was strong as the oak, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. That's God talking, and he's talking about Og, the Bashan. So, this is the inheritance now of the two and a half tribes, remember? Half tribe of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben wanted their inheritance on the east side. And that's going to be theirs, but it's conquered. So, when they got ready to cross the Jordan River, remember, they said they've got their fences and everything. And they said, then we'll, we'll come help y'all fight. And they did. So, that's what's going on now. In Psalm 135, these, these scriptures will stop, start popping out at you now because you know who these people are. This is talking about God who smote great nations and he slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, all the kingdoms of Canaan, and he gave their land for an heritage unto his people Israel. And in Psalm 136, to him that smote the great kings, for his mercy endures forever. He slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. You're going to read in the Old Testament, God talks about defeating these two kings. They are fierce. And they're Amorite. And they had all that land. Now, for the rest of the lesson, you and I are going to delve into a, 
uh, some writings, and I've given you the bibliography at the end of the lesson where I took a lot of what I'm about to say. There is a book by Michael Heiser, who is a uh, Christian Jew, and uh, he uh, is associated with the Israeli Bible Center. You know, in Israel, they do a lot of digs, and they do a lot of uh, the archaeological stuff. So you and I are going to delve into the unseen realm and see what's going on. So I have a question for you. What do Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, as the Christ at Caesarea Philippi, the Nephilim from Genesis 6, the worship of Baal, the location of Mount Hermon, and the land of Bashan, and the strong bulls of Bashan. What do they all have in common? So we're going to look at each section and then try to put it all together. And the reason I went through everything I just went through, so you know the section of land we're talking about. So everybody knows that land on the east side of the river. Okay, <clears throat> now, Scripture states that there is a huge connection between angels and there's a huge connection to different nations of the world. We're going to go to Daniel. In Daniel, the Jews, Daniel is about 80-something years old now, and he's been in Babylon since he was 16 or 17. Now, he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he sees that the captivity of the Jews is to be how long? 70 years. Well, let's see, I was 15 or 16, and I'm about 80 now. Woo, it's about time that their deliverance is going to come. And so he knows the Jews are about to return to Jerusalem from their captivity. And it says Daniel began to pray and fast for their return. So that's what Daniel's doing, and he's still doing it three weeks later. And so three weeks later, it says, somebody touched me. And there's an angel that touched him and made him tremble on his knees and on the palms of his hands. And I can imagine. And the, Dan and the angel says to Daniel, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. You are beloved. Understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand up because I have now been sent to you. And he says in Daniel 10, verse 12, he said to me, don't fear. Here it is again, an angel talking to me. Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, three weeks ago, and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Three weeks ago, my words were heard, my prayer was heard, and I have come because of your words. Now, I want y'all to really focus, and y'all stay with me. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me these 21 days. Do we have a demonic spirit that's in control of Persia? He's fighting Daniel. All right. And behold, Michael, who's one of the archangels, chief, had to come help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. Are y'all getting the picture? Do, you know, you and I, I think, forget about the spiritual warfare that's going on in the unseen realm that we can't see. That's what this is describing. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return because I've got to go fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, who's coming next? The prince of Greece. Now... I think this gives us some insight into this spiritual warfare that goes on in the unseen realm. 21 days for Daniel to even start getting an answer to his prayer because the answer was hindered by the kingdom of Persia, the prince. This is a demonic spirit that's holding him up. He's fighting him to go, go give Daniel the answer. Y'all with me? Okay, so there seems to be an angel that's overseeing the nation of Persia. Do you agree? Okay, now it seems to be that this demon does not want the Jews returning to the land. Who's interceding? Daniel. Who is in charge of the Israelite people right now? I mean, at that time, Persia, right? Because it wasn't Babylon anymore because Cyrus the Great had come in, and it's Persia now. 
So the demonic spirit is coming against the answer to Daniel. He doesn't want them being returned. He wants them to stay under captivity. Are y'all following me? I hope so. Now, the Jews are under Persian rule. They had been under Babylonian, right? Now they're under Persia, and what did the angel tell him? He said, I've got to get back. We've got to fight the kings of per the spirits of Persia because who's going to come next? Greece. Who? In the Go to Daniel's statue. Yes. Babylon, and then Persia, and Greece. Greece isn't going to want them to go back to the land either. The demonic spirits always wanting to keep us in captivity under the enemy. Now... Why are they fighting so hard? Because they don't want prophecy fulfilled. Had Isaiah prophesied, no, Jeremiah prophesied they would be released at the end of 70 years. Yes, Daniel's praying for it. He can't get an answer because they're fighting up here about it. Now, did y'all follow that? Yeah, I'm t that just kind of blew me away. Because I know it had to fulfill prophecy. If it hadn't happened... The prophecy wouldn't have been fulfilled. And then what does that seem to make God? Okay. So after his battle with the prince of Persia, the angel said, now the prince of Greece is going to be coming. Oh, yeah. And because Greece is going to be the next world empire. Alexander the Great, he wants everybody, right? And he built this huge empire. Now, if I go to the New Testament, rulers are used to describe orders of angels, they may include these various angels over the nations. So do you agree with me or can you see that there are <clears throat> not only angels over countries, but there are also demonic spirits over countries? Okay, we know that, that spiritual warfare. Rulers is used in the New Testament of good and bad angels. If we go to Paul in Ephesians 6, our struggle is never against flesh and blood. But it's against who? The rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Y'all connecting all the dots? Oh, it's going to get better. Now, so the point is, in this scripture, Michael the archangel we know is the angel for Israel. He's the one watching over Israel. There are other angels that oversee the various nations, and Scripture gives examples of angels looking over the affairs of Greece, over the affairs of Persia. These orders of angels are perhaps the rulers that Paul referred to when he said our struggle is with spiritual forces. Now we're going to move to Mount Hermon, which we have touched on, and I'm just going to review a little bit about it. Mount Hermon is, look at the very top of your map. That's kind of the northern border of King Og's land. It was one of two sacred mountains of the Canaanite people. And there's a spiritual battle throughout the ages that has gone on through Mount Hermon, and God's mountain is Mount Zion. And there has been a battle forever. It says in uh, Psalm 68, I think that might say, when mountains battle... It says God chose Mount Zion for his dwelling, even though it's a lot smaller, less imposing than Mount Hermon, which is over 9,000 feet. Does God choose the weaker things, smaller, etc.? The psalmist David pictured the other mountains as jealous because they were not selected. Mount Zion was to be God's dwelling place. Now, this also, Mount Hermon, was the mountain of Baal. And we learn that when we go to the Old Testament with Jezebel. It's also where the rebellious angels left their estate and they cohabited with the daughters of men and created the hybrid race of the Nephilim. So we have all this. Uh, the Phoenicians. Who was the Phoenician princess? Jezebel. She married Ahab. Did they rule over the northern kingdom? Yes, for a time, and she brought in temples and statues and all the pagan religion of Baal. They considered Mount Hermon to be the mountain of Baal. Now, this is in King Og's land, all right? Now, if I go to Judges and First Chronicles, 
It tells me the mountain was sacred to the worshipers of the Canaanite god, Canaanite god Baal. Extensive excavations found over 20 temples on the slope of this one mountain. And Mount Hermon, the holiest of all mountains for the Canaanite and the Baal religion, a lot of mystical things went on there as well. Now, if I go to the book of Enoch, which I'm not going to justify today because I did that a couple of weeks ago. Mount Hermon was the gathering place of those rebellious angels who descended from the height to mate with the daughters of men, and we got a hybrid race that was part human, part non-human, called the Nephilim. And here's a picture that kind of depicts they are in that spiritual realm, and Jude tells us they left their first estate. And so they were doing things they were not supposed to be doing. They were rebellious, and we got a group of Nephilim out of that, And that's one reason God brought the flood, because we were getting this race of people that were not all human. And when it says Noah found grace and he was perfect before God, his seed had not been contaminated. Right. Okay. Now, Hermon means harem, H-E-R-E-M. And it means a thing that is devoted to God for destruction. The verb form is H-A-R-A-M, and it means he is devoting to destruction because it is set apart to God alone. This is the same word that's used in all the conquest of the land of Canaan uh, in Deuteronomy to Joshua. Same word. God devoted it to destruction. You say, that sounds awful. He had given them years to repent. So, we're going to go to the land of Bashan now. I'm just trying to give you some different categories in this in this. Uh, piece of land, this property. Bashan means place of the serpent. (laughs) Okay, Mount Hermon is um, at my red, red dot, and then Phoenicia is just off to the left. You see the yellow dot? Just to the west, and that's where Jezebel came from. That's where we got all that Canaanite stuff in the religion of Baal coming in. And Caesarea Philippi is in this area. The Gadarenes are in this area. Some of the lessons we've had in the last few weeks. Now, Bashan can mean, it has two meanings. Bashan can mean, oh, it's like a fertile, stoneless piece of ground. Do you see all this lush, fertile pasture land? And in the Bible, it talks about the strong bulls of Bashan. This was a great place to fatten the cattle. And so that was one thing that the two and a half tribes wanted, remember? They were cattlemen, and they said, this land looks so good for our cows. And so, that's one thing it can mean. Remember, oh yeah, I said that. They were desirable. What were they wanting? Cows. They wanted this land because it would be so good for their cows. But it has another meaning of the root is serpent. Oh, that gets so interesting. Remember Eve? Did something look good? To make her wise? Yes. So, the same thing here. This land can look great, but it also means serpent. So, y'all getting the picture of what's going on in this piece of land? Bashan was called the land of hell, or hell of the Rephaim. Remember Og? He's a Rephaim. It was said to be the residence, this whole land of Bashan, This is the spirits of the dead and the deified kings. Amorite King Og, he was a giant with six fingers and toes, and this is where he resided. Now, it says in one of the scriptures, I didn't didn't write it down here, only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. So when they got rid of him, was he the last one? His bedstead, and it goes into that, and... Uh, It was about 13 by 6, so they figure he was about 10 to 11 feet tall. Now, although Og reigned over the Amorites, and he was called the king of the Amorites, he belonged to the Rephaim, terrible ones, as was Goliath, and he was their last survivor. In Joshua 12, listen to the passage. The other king was Og, king of Bashan, and his territory, he was of the remnant of the giants. In Hebrew, that's the Rephaim. He dwelt at Ashtaroth, 
which we've already talked about, and Edrei, which is on your map. That's where he had two dwellings. He reigned over Mount Hermon. Oh, boy. We have a Rephaim reigning over Mount Hermon, over Salka, over all of Bashan, as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Maccathites, over half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. He is reigning over a lot of that area, right? Okay. Now, I think that's all I'm showing you, is that he reigns from the purple box down there at Heshbon, clear up to Mount Hermon. He reigns. And he is a Rephaim. Now, Mount Hermon is one of the two sacred mountains, and it's called the Gate of Hell or the Gate of Hades. Now, I'm going to take you into some new material that I had not known until this past week. And I'm taking some information from the Amorite dynasty of Ugarit. Now, I don't think this is on your map, or is it? Did I make a little arrow? Anyway, uh, on this map up here, you can see Mount Hermon was one of their sacred mountains, and the other one was a mountain in the northwestern part of Syria in the little town of Ugarit. All right, so they had two sacred mountains. And King Og dwelled here at the purple box. <laughs> and then Damascus, you see Damascus probably on your map. Okay, so Ugarit is just to the northwest of Damascus. One of the oldest cities, huge civilization, and they have done extensive archaeological digs there. So we're going to look at this area. Oh, I have a map here. Here's Damascus, which is just above Mount Hermon. And then Ugarit is off to your northwest. Okay, everybody with me and kind of know where we are on the map. Here are some ruins. It is one of the oldest cities of Canaan, and it was a flourishing city in its day. Up there in the northwest corner of modern-day Syria, El was the father of the gods and the creator of all, and he was the Canaanite high deity, and here is like a carving in stone of him. Now, the Ugaritic text, they have all these texts and they have found these tablets and everything and people have deciphered the, their language, one of the earliest languages, and they identified the whole area of Bashan as the underworld. All right? Now, remember the land of Bashan, serpent. For the Canaanites of Ugarit, we had Canaanites living up in Ugarit. The Bashan region represented hell. It was the celestial and infernal abode of all their deified dead kings. So this is like the spirits will say, okay, according to them. Now, I took some information from the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. It says, it is possible that this localization of the Canaanite hell is linked to the ancient tradition of the place as the ancestral home of their dynasty. The dynasty of these kings is the biblical Rephaim. And Og is a Rephaim. Okay, are we putting puzzle pieces together? If you're following. Now, all these tablets they have found, lots of them. The Rephaim are the subject of an entire set of tablets that they retrieve from the ruins at Ugarit. And they describe the Rephaim as the gods, the divine ones, and the warriors of Baal. They called them the Rephaim of the underworld. <clears throat> These descriptions are very consistent now with the Bible. Because it denotes Rephaim to denote several tribes of giants in Canaan. Also, the spirits of the dead, including its, at least some that were slain in the flood. And you can read that in Job, I believe, is the reference. So there's complete agreement between, if I take the Ugaritic text, I don't want to lose y'all because you'll need to understand this to get to the end. We have all this agreement between the Ugaritic text, biblical text, pagan Greek tradition, I can go to ancient Jewish tradition and the ancient church tradition that the demons were the souls of a race of heroes, they called them in Greek, gods in the Ugaritic text, and in the Bible, hybrid human angelic race, who once walked the earth, died, but they thought their spirits could be contacted, and the spirit remained. Now, suddenly... When I see all that, 
No wonder the terror shown by the Midianites and the Canaanites. They have lived in this. It makes perfect sense. It's not just a dread that God sent to paralyze them. What do they see when they see the Israelites coming? This mysterious people. They're walking under the visible presence of the Holy One, a God that just destroyed Egypt to take his people out. He's just marched his people through Canaanite hell of the land of Bashan and with King Heshbon, Sihon of Heshbon. And he, they, killed, they killed King Og. This is only the warm-up to the conquest of the rest of the land. No wonder they're afraid. But God also put the fear in them. Now, I want to look at a section called Provoking the Forces of Hell, and there's two events. And we have covered these in recent lessons, so we're just going to skip them, skip, skip over them lightly. Remember the exorcism of the legion of demons with the demoniac man. Jesus and his disciples had crossed over Galilee to the eastern shore. They were literally stepping into territory that was ruled by the fallen angel rulers. Everybody see that? Because they're going into the land of Bashan. So this is the place of the serpent, the fallen angel rulers. Now, when confronted by the Son of God, what did these demons say? Don't send us away. What? They didn't want to be sent to the abyss. Because some had already been chained in Tartarus, remember? And they were there forever till the judgment. They wanted, they didn't want that to happen to them. They didn't want to go out of the country. This is their territory. So they didn't want to go out of that. It says, oh, we see some pigs over there. Would you send us into the pigs? There were about 2,000 of them. Send us into the pigs and we will enter them. This country of the Gerasenes was within the ancient boundaries of Bashan. The demons begged, please don't send us out of this piece of real estate. They were the spirits, possibly, of the Rephaim who had dwelt there for thousands of years, being alternately sought out. People seeking spirits, remember? People still do seances and try to call up spirits. And some people feared them. Now, what was the people's response when this happened? Jesus, get out of our territory. Remember, even the people did not want him staying there. Now, the other event was the journey to Caesarea Philippi, which you and I have done. And remember, when he crossed Galilee, he healed the man that was born blind at Bethsaida. And then he and his disciples walk up to Caesarea Philippi. Now, in New Testament times, Caesarea Philippi was on the border of ancient Bashan. It lay at the foot of Mount Hermon. What's there? all these Greek temples and these statues to the Greek gods. This is associated with Baal because it was the Canaanite mountain of Baal, the Nephilim, the place of the serpent, and the realm of the dead. They are in dark place, right? Associated with it. Earlier, this area was a cave grotto dedicated to various fertility gods which be were believed to go in the ground during the winter and then come out in the summer. Remember, that was a, almost a bottomless pit in there. It was so deep, they called this hole the Gate of Hades. And it had access, they said, to the underworld. They had the Cave of Pan, which I'm showing you on the screen here with the yellow arrow. And they said this had access to the realm of the dead and to the underworld, all the spirits. And we're in the land of Bashan. Now remember, they're out there, and in Jesus' day, they had all these temples. There were about seven temples, and they had all these niches in the, the mountain, and they had all these statues that were dedicated to false gods. And, it's, and Jesus asked Peter, or no, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And this is the area and the atmosphere where Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now you know everything that was going on in that area when Peter said that. In the midst of the Baal shrines at Caesarea Philippi, etched into the side of Mount Hermon to worship Pan, Peter proclaimed Jesus to be the Christ. This is no coincidence that his testimony was made among all this pagan worship. In the darkest place possible, Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? And the light of God shone through on Bashan through Peter's confession. 
Isn't that awesome? Now, what did he say as soon as that happened? In verse 20, now he charged his disciples, don't tell anybody that I am the Christ. He said, I'm immediately going to begin to, he began to tell the disciples, I got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and die because of his ministry, but keep it quiet that I'm the Christ for now. Now, at this point, Jesus had shown part of his hand. The game plan was starting to unfold, and the enemy's getting a whiff of the plan, right? The sons of God. Think of where he is. He's up in Bashan. Think of where he is. These sons of God, these fallen angels and gods from that region, they're not going to give up willingly. Now, this is the most incredible thing I learned this week. Psalm 22. You know this is a messianic psalm. David is describing in detail the crucifixion, even though crucifixion wasn't a thing. Okay. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Do not be fear, far, do not be far from me. Trouble is near. There is none to help. Go to verse 11, and this ought to jump out at you. Many bulls have surrounded me. Those strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouth as a ravening and a roaring lion. I tell you, after I studied all we've just studied, that jumped off the page at me. The psalmist wasn't showing a vision of angry bulls from the Golan Heights surrounding Christ on the cross. He was given a glimpse into the future at the spirits from Bashan, demonic entities represented by bulls who surrounded the cross to celebrate what they thought was their victory over the Messiah. This picture shows it very well. Christ on the cross... And those demonic spirits referred to as the strong bulls of Bashan. And now you know what the area of Bashan was like. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The strong bulls of Bashan are encircling me. Their mouths are open. They gape at me like roaring lions. Because they thought they had won. They thought they had won the victory. The curiously worded strong bulls of Bashan surrounding Jesus at the time, I believe, were the unseen forces of darkness that gathered to ensure his incarnation is coming to an end. Now, let's go to Paul in 1 Corinthians. Listen to these words. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's a hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world for our glory. None of the princes of this world knew it. For had they known it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Isn't that awesome? Now, could these be the strong bulls of Bashan, the sons of God, maybe from the Nephilim in Genesis 6, who are now, they believed, were the gods and rulers of nations. Did we see that nations and demons have territory? Yes. Could it be that that's what he's referring to? Paul says they wouldn't have done this if they had known that resurrection was part of God's mystery hidden before time began, for it was a massive goal, it was a sting operation, and the cross, quote, was the ultimate honey trap. <laughs> wow. And then in Colossians, it says, He canceled the record of charges against you and me, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over them in the cross. Hallelujah. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I... I just cannot even express how excited 